Okay, so in, in this video, we're gonna talk about a concept that many people find very challenging to understand. Uh, it's the concept of a formal limit. So, so far, we've talked about limits in the context of them being able to be computed in a very casual way. Not casual, well, informal. But what I'm basically trying to say is that if we have a function like this, right, all we had to do in the previous videos, all we had to do up till now, was simply plug in the value of 4 in, inside the function, and we'd end up with a limit, which would be 17 in this square. But how do we actually know this? In order to prove this, we need to be able to understand an argument. So suppose we're here. I have a function. Let's not consider this function. Let's consider a, an arbitrary function at this point. Right? Let's consider that. We don't know what it is. We just care about the limit at a particular point. So I'm going to try to approach. And bear in mind that fx is a real valued function at this point. Right? So we'll try to approach a particular value a, and we know that it's going to equal l, which is the limit in this case. So let's choose a to be that point over here. If a is this point, we know that on the y-axis, it's going to get closer and closer to L, right? That's what we talked about in the previous videos. So let's try to understand this in a different way. I'm going to draw an open interval over here. An open interval is basically an interval around A that does not include the outer boundaries, right? And I'm going to tell you guys that this length is equal to delta, and so is this length. So basically, A ke aage delta hai, or A ke piche bhi delta, hai, which means that this coordinate in this interval turns out to be A plus delta, and that coordinate tends to out to be a minus delta, right? So what I want you guys to consider at this point is what happens around this open interval. If you take this open interval, the left side of this open interval, and try to extend it to the function, you observe something. You observe the value getting closer and closer to another value L over here, right? And if you do that for this part over, it turns out to give you another value. So what I want you guys to understand with this point, at this point is that um, this is not really a pure function that we're talking about, right? So uh, I'm going to try to explain it to you in a very simplistic way, and then you guys can apply it to any function, any general form, the rule that we're going to derive from this. So we know that this is L, and we know that when we extend the left-hand side, we approach this side. So this gives us a value L minus something, right? So what's happening is, this particular interval, the interval delta, is corresponding to another interval on the y-axis, right? And let's just call this epsilon for now. And if we consider a ke aage wala part, we get a plus delta, right? And that's corresponding to another interval, which is epsilon as well. So this y-coordinate over here turns out to be epsilon plus, well, L, and that turns out to be L minus epsilon. So you guys need to understand that as we're getting closer and closer to A, the open interval is getting closer and closer to A as well. So if that's a particular point, this is the open interval initially, this as we're getting closer and closer to the point. So the open interval is getting closer and closer to this point A as we're trying to get closer to the point A, right? As we're trying to evaluate the limit basically. And this is happening on the x-axis, on the y-axis we know that there's a limit L, and we're getting closer and closer to that. And the thing that you guys need to understand is that this is happening simultaneously. If you get one step closer over here, we're going to get one step closer to L. So there has to be a relation between delta and epsilon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quantify this. I'm going to try to quantify this. What I'm going to say is that if I have a value x, right? now. Now what I need to know is that the like, value of x is changing at every particular point, right? So if I get closer and closer to this a, x is initially this and and it gets closer and closer to a, right? So it's a variable that's changing. So what I'm saying is the absolute value of x minus delta, actually x minus a, because try to understand this. We're trying to find the distance between x and a. So over here, x is this, right? and x is getting closer and closer to that. And x could be on that side as well. It doesn't really matter at this point. Um, so x either be and it's getting closer and closer to a, right? 
and uh, x is the variable over here that's changing that's approaching a the limit point the point at which we are trying to evaluate the limit right so the distance between x and a we're going to say that this has to be less than a threshold at delta right and it has to be greater than zero obviously right because if it's not greater than zero then the whole argument of the concept of limits breaks down if you think about it then it basically means k x minus a is equal to zero right and that means x equals a which means k limit approach ni kari a ko equal ho a k which is wrong the whole concept of limit is that it gets closer and closer to a so we derive that x minus a the absolute value of this has to be less than delta right and this has to imply that the function f of x that's changing over here right there's something happening on the y-axis as well minus the limit and the absolute value of that has to be greater than zero which we know for a fact but also less than epsilon and epsilon ladies and gentlemen has to be a function of delta well actually the idea is that delta that's determined later is a function of epsilon not the other way around but if you think about it you can interchange that um, but for now what you need to understand for a fact is that we're going to be starting out with the right hand expression over here and we're going to try to evaluate a delta knowing an epsilon and epsilon is going to be in a general form right and so is delta so the whole concept of formal limits can be described using this rule well most of the concept anyway and if you know this then you can pretty much evaluate the formal limit of any given problem um, by applying a mathematical trick now that's something you guys could do on your own right um, applying mathematical tricks to get a desired solution is another domain but we are going to try to do as many examples as we can so that we can get this rule down and we can apply it to any particular situation so the first example that I want to do is uh, basically going to involve the function x squared minus 9 divided by x minus 3. So try to understand that we're going to find a regular limit first and then use the idea we know, use the values we obtain to find epsilon and delta for that particular limit, right? So the limit as x approaches 3 for x squared minus 9 divided by x minus 3, we know that we can evaluate this by simply factorizing the numerator that gives me x minus 3 x plus 3 which can be divided by x minus 3 right and uh, we know that x minus 3 has to divide out x minus 3 because uh, since x never gets equal to 3 it just approaches 3 which means this is never going to be equal to 0 or 0 which means we can cancel it out it's safe to do so and then we're going to simply plug in a 3 over here to get a value of 6 so the limit in this case is 6 so the thing you need to know for a formal limit is this this is the general formula for the formal limit and in this case we have the particular values we have a a equals 3 the number we're trying to approach and L equals 6 what you may have noticed is that when we write down the formal limit um, theorem if I may then we have fx and x right so basically x minus a the absolute value of this has to be less than delta and that implies fx minus l has to be less than epsilon and they're both greater than zero i'm just not mentioning that because it's implied so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with this and we're going to try to end up with that let's do it if we have f of x what's f of x it's x squared minus 9 divided by x minus 3 we just talked about that so it's x squared minus 9 divided by x minus 3 and this minus the limit the limit is 6 as we figured it out has to be less than epsilon now we have an inequality over here let's try to figure this out and see if we can maybe change this so if I try to simplify the solution that's inside I get x squared minus 9 minus 6 x plus 18 it's divided by x minus 3 right and this is less than epsilon and this turns out to give me x squared minus 6 x plus 9 divided by x minus 3 now we pretty much know what to do over here let's just try to simplify it um, we can see that it's we can factorize this by breaking minus 6 down this gives me x minus 3 and x minus 3 pretty simple and we can rewrite it as x minus 3 squared divided by x minus 3 
the absolute value of that is less than epsilon. So basically that would divide out and what I end up with is this. Now what does this mean? I started out with this equation over here, inequality actually, and I eventually ended up with this. As you can see, this is exactly what we need. It's x minus 3, where a equals 3 as we decided over here, and l equals 6 as decided over here. And the function is f of x, which is this. So if you think about it, now the delta, the value of delta, we have it right in front of our eyes. Epsilon equals delta. So for this particular limit, what this is suggesting is that a change of delta, let's go talk about this concept that a change of delta over here corresponds to an equal change of epsilon on the y-axis that's the giveaway from this lecture that's the idea of an informal limit that you guys need to understand so we need to gauge lambda um, delta and epsilon I don't know where lambda came from but we need to gauge these two values we need to find a relation between them and we just did by doing a particular example. So for this case, this relationship holds true. So see you guys in the next video. We're going to be talking about some proofs um, based on the formula limit. So let's just look forward to that.